We are here in the, at the University of Nairobi in a large auditorium that is largely empty. And so we hope that many of you are joining us on YouTube virtually. And if you're joining us um, virtually, please use the hashtag FSD Lecture um, to tweet or um, engage on social media around this event. This year, FSD Kenya is delighted to be co-hosting the annual lecture with the University of Nairobi's Institute for Development Studies. And not only are we co-hosting this um, annual lecture, we are co-hosting a book launch for Julie Zolman's Living on Bill. And of course, Julie Zolman is our annual lecturer this year. But I'd like to take you back uh, more than 20 years to another book that I was a part of helping get published called The Poor and Their Money. This book was published in 2000, but I started working on the publication of it in 1999. And it is based on some seminal research that was done by Stuart Rutherford in Bangladesh, looking at how poor people manage their money. One of the pivotal ideas that came from this book was the idea that poor people save up, they save down, and they save through. And several years later, I had the um, opportunity to follow some of the, the um, savings collectors who worked with Stuart in Dhaka and see how they were um, collecting savings and borrowings, the savings up, down, and through of the people in Dhaka. And they were fintech ahead of time. These savings collectors had palm pilots, if anybody can make call of the bar. And they used the palm pilots to track the savings that these poor people were um, putting each day. And the picture that a lot of the women, especially, were illiterate. And there was a picture of a mud bank, a traditional savings bank in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. And when they entered the money onto the palm pilot, a sound came. And it was the sound of coins dropping into a mud bank. And the women told me they knew their savings were in there when they heard the sound of those coins on the palm pilot. Ten years later, another book came out, and I was privileged to be at the book launch with Portfolios of the Poor, um, based on financial diaries in several different countries. And what it was building on, it was also Stuart Rutherford was one of the uh, authors of that, it was building on the research from Poor and Their Money, but really trying to collect the financial transactions and the financial portfolios of people who are living on little. It has been an influential book around uh, the financial inclusion community, including here in Kenya. The, the founders of Mshwari um, read this book when they were designing Mshwari, and it helped them think about how to design products that are appropriate for those who are living on little. So fast forward more than 10 years from the publication of Portfolios on the Poor, and tonight, but this afternoon, we are launching Living on Little by Julie Zolman. This book, which will be launched at the end of our annual lecture by Dr. Radha Tapia. Uh, I don't think the sound's working, is it? Can you confirm? It's okay? Great. Uh, sorry. Technical difficulties, when everything's virtual, you can't tell if you're actually reaching the virtual crowd. Um, we're delighted to be launching this book. And you're going to hear some of the stories from this book, from Julie, and some of the implications of those stories. After Julie's lecture, we've got an incredible group of experts who are going to be talking about the insights from this important research and the implications for how we in Kenya can have an even more inclusive finance, financial sector than we do now. Julie Zolman is a PhD candidate at um, the University of Tufts University, the Fletcher School. She is studying the impact of the digital economy on labor markets here in Nairobi. She's also an independent re researcher and has worked with FSD Kenya for many years, not only on financial diaries, but on applying the insights from financial diaries to others um, and uh, work around gender and some other topics. I think you're going to love what she has to share with you and what our panelists have to share with you. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce the, the video. There's going to be a short 10 minute video. Originally when we had hoped this was going to be an in-person event, we had hoped to have some of the respondents and some of the researchers from the financial diaries here, but that wasn't possible. And so instead we went to them and we captured some of their powerful stories that we're about to share with you. Please remember if you're, if you're on social media, the hashtag is hashtag FSD lecture and enjoy the video.
me, uh, we always feel like poverty is a bad thing and we want to come out of it. You even want to, to help people get out of poor situations and all. But for me, I think it's, it's part of life. Uh, the way we, 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 some people even describe it as a disease. And when you say poverty is a disease, then you mean like a huge population in Kenya is diseased. They are, they are sick. But this is their life. Like you might die, you might get born, live and die in the same situation. But how do we embrace it and live life in it? Nishanga, niliona munauliza maswali hata ya nikasema Ununua chumvi, ununua chumvi kiasi gani, ununua Kapanya hii ni maswali ya watoto Mwanzo mwanzo sikuwa nimejua sababu But badaye, ilikuja nikaelewa, nikafuraia Wakati ilikuwa unakuja, unatuuliza Na biyashara inye nilikuwa ninafanya wakati huo Ni biyashara inye serikali haitaki Na ulikuwa una, una, unaenda, una, unaingia mpaka mahali, tulikuwa nimeficha hizo vitu, hata nilikuja nikaogopa labda unaweza nipeleka kwa serikali, unishitaki, unilete maskari. Hiyo ndiyo ilikuwa inanifanya saa zingine ilikuwa muoga. Hmm. Nini, sipendi hizo mambo ya loans. Nina uoga na loans. Ninaweza kopa, labda inishinde kulipa. Ndiyo sababu naogopa kukopa loans. Naweza kopa alone, nishindi wa kulipa, na watakuja kunidai, ama wakuja kunyanganya ye hile nye nilikopa nisipuwa sipendi hivo. Wanawake challenges nye tunapitia, mimi nikiwa ndani. Wanamme wengi, wameachia wanawake responsibilities. Most of the responsibilities, in this community, most of the responsibilities, wameachia wanawake kujali watoto kulisha watoto in most cases wa, ukienda shule wakita ni kutano shule ni unapata out of a hundred utapata wanamme labda ni ten ama twenty lakini majority unapata ni wamama sasa yani wanawachia wamama hizo responsibilities nyingi taking care of the kids Sasa mimi nilikuwa nimeenda kuuguza dadangu. Wakati nilikuwa huko watoto wakanipigia simu, "Made, oh baba ameuza ng'ombe." Nilikasirika sana. Nilikasirika hata nikasema sasa sijui huyo mzee ni baki kwetu ama ni nirudi kwa boma lakini <laughs> vile nina watoto nilirudi. Hiyo nilikasirika na mzee sana. Lakini wakati nilirudi Tulielewana ni tuka katu, sasa utafanya nini hiyo ni kawaida. Mm. Naishi katika umda mta wa Bangladeshi. Mimi ni mama wa watoto watatu. Na upande wa riziki yangu, patika yangu chakila siku, uwa naenda kanyo na kulia watu na na karanga pia nchuru kidogo kidogo nya ajisukuma nao kwa maisha. Oh, uh, mimi na matarajio kuwa I think Mungu anipe nguvu, anipe uwezo ili nizidi kwanza watu wangu niwasomeshe. Ili wawe na maisha mazuri wasipitie yale ambayo mimi nimeyapitia. Maisha mazuri ni mtu mwenye umeajiriwa unajua vizuri kila mwezi wapate 1000 zako au 1500 zako unajipanga hata kama ni kidogo unajipanga nayo ndio maana yake nimesema hiyo ndio maisha mazuri. Mm -hmm. Kenya ingekuwa inajua ni watu wanaishi huku mashinani kuangalia venye watu wana hustle huku chini na kuangalia wale wenye wana biashara ndogo ndogo ili wa promote at least kitu kama hiyo and then kitu ya pili tena ufisadi. Ufisadi pia kama ungekuwa hauko at least unge benefit lakini kwa sasa hii mission maana yake kuna siasa nyingi kuna mseme ni ubinafsi yani hawaelewi kwamba watu wanapitia huku nini chini wanaangalia zao peke yao ah mimi nilifurahisha tu manake nilijua kwamba mtu hawezi tu akakuja tu from now akaanza kukuhoji labda kuna sababu labda kuna tumaini labda kuna kuna kitu anatafuta cha muhimu 
kuna labda nawafaitia kule labda kuna pale anayekamezana nataka kujua ah wa Kenya wanaishi vipi wa chini manake kulingana na hata wabunge wa wetu hakuna mtu yote mwenye amefanya kitu yenye mnafanya hakuna mtu yote mwenye amefikia katika mlango wa mtu akamoji wewe unaishi vipi vipi bona sasa baka tangine na lia tangine sasa amekuja tukishare tukishare naona at least nimetulia hata kama hakuna chochote alikuwa anani lakini huko share na yeye ilikuwa inanisaidia mimi naona mimi niko sawa kwani nimefikia niko fresh tu eh <laughs>
Lucy Kenya and the Institute for Development for the invitation to speak with all of you. It's an incredible honor to follow the illustrious speakers who stood before me at this podium. Thank you also to our hosts for giving us something to celebrate in what's been a pretty rough year. This book that we're launching today is the product of an enormous team effort. COVID's meant that our, our researchers and our team have been here this afternoon. I'm so glad we could share that video and bring a little bit of their spirit into this space. I hope that I make all of you proud. But I should also make it clear that the arguments in this book um, and in this lecture are mine um, and don't necessarily reflect the views of either FSD Kenya or my colleagues. The first time that I came to Kenya was in 2010. I had just finished a master's program and I had been hired on a, a trial basis by DSA to go out and explore the concept of financial capability. I went out to the country and met lots of people and I only came to Nairobi at the very end and it was my first trip to Nairobi. And I came into the FSD office and I was just treated with such warmth and enthusiasm. I really wasn't surprised, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that as a client. It's to have spent the last 10 years working with people like FSD Kenya who are so sincerely devoted to creating meaningful change for ordinary people. I look forward to this event, the annual lecture, every year. A major reason is that it gives me a chance to see many of you in this community that FSD helps to nurture. Um, and FSD has really created a special space with this event of the annual lecture, inviting us to pause in our normal work step back and ask really big questions about the financial sector, where it's heading, and how we might imagine it differently as an engine for development and inclusion in Kenya. That kind of dreaming doesn't go to waste in Kenya. Perhaps sometimes we take it for granted, but Kenya is a place that changes. Um, I've been working here for the past 10 years, and I've seen that hope of Kenyans rise and fall and rise and fall but at the same time, under, underlying all of that, there's a deep down spirit um, that is not just optimistic, but determined to bring new ideas to life. It's what I love about working and living here. There's another important person who's not with us today, um, and I know she would have loved to see this event. And that person is my dear friend, Nompumeledo Ngomechulu. Pumi was my closest friend and co-conspirator at the... Um, The two of us worked together in the early 2000s at the peak of the death uh, wave of the HIV crisis. The physical, social, and mental consequences of that pandemic were utterly devastating. And there I was, 23 or 24 years old, sent by the Peace Corps to do something. And Pumi was assigned by our chief to do something too. We decided we should first try to understand what was going on, and Pumi taught me how to listen. It involved joining people, fetching water, gathering firewood up in the mountains. It involved endless hours of chatting and grass nests while waiting for this or that meeting to begin when an NGO official or the chief would finally arrive. I was still learning um, Siswati, so Pumi taught me how to listen to body. After several months of sitting mute, the words started to make sense too. I could ask questions, reflect back, some kind of understanding. And all of that listening pointed us to a few um, key things that we thought we could do, and we did those. Last year, on December 23rd, as I was getting all ready for the holidays, I got a text from a friend in the village that Mpumi had died. I'm told that she went to the hospital to deliver her baby and that she died while waiting to be seen by a doctor. I'm so sad that Pumi is not here to see this lecture and where all of that listening that she taught me has led. I'm also outraged that so many women in Swaziland, here in Canada, and even in my home country of the United States, face that fate when we have um, a world in which the solutions actually already exist. Pumi's death reminded me about the themes of this book that we're launching today, which asks, what use is science, tech, and our other development tools in actually building a society that creates possibility for everyone? 
what would we do differently if we really understood people's development challenges more holistically? The Nobel winning economist and philosopher Amartya Sen argued very famously that development is freedom. He argued that meaningful development gains would involve grappling with questions of governance, not just economics. Much of his early work was around famine, where he showed that avoiding mass starvation was not a question of the economics of food production, but rather the politics of its distribution. I was recently rereading Sen's 1977 paper called Starvation and Ex Exchange Entitlements, which tries to explain the causes of the Bengal famine of 1942 to 44, which killed 3 million people. Sen shows that as the famine approached, and even as it started claiming lives, the government was tracking food availability. As you can see in this slide, um, the fluctuations in actual food availability in the area were actually relatively minor. It was hard to see that a crisis was developing under the surface. What officials were not paying attention to was the price of food, and in particular, the purchasing power of landless laborers. Sen pulls together a variety of variables in his paper to show that the famine was caused by the deteriorating purchasing power of these rural wage workers in an environment of price, but not wage inflation. This price inflation um, was driven by the Japanese invasion of Burma, which brought the region closer to the war front. As you can see in this other chart, um, how much rice that a day of labor could purchase was fluctuating wildly. But policymakers narrow focus on food availability kept them from seeing what was happening and responding in a way that could have saved lives. This tragedy was exacerbated by India's colonization. The Raj was eager to bring relief to Calcutta, the urban center, to make sure that workers could stay in the factories, fueling industrial production that was supporting the war effort. But rural destitution wasn't as urgent or as visible. And at the same time, the British, ostensibly protecting their war interests, blocked new imports of food, which could have brought down prices and saved lives. Sen's work was groundbreaking in two respects. First, this piece and the many others that followed showed the incredible importance of governance, and Sen argued in particular for democracy in preventing famine and other egregious forms of human suffering. Second, Sen's work points out the incredible importance of seeing the whole picture, of using our peripheral vision to see new things and to correct our erroneous theories about the way the world works. Sen wrote, the failure of the government to anticipate the famine, and even to recognize it when it revealed itself, seems to have been the result largely of erroneous theories about famine causation, rather than mistakes about the facts of food availability. Referring to the government's singular focus on food availability, he wrote, quote, it was a search in a dark room for a black cat that was not there. Obviously, I think there are lots of parallels to what we're doing in financial inclusion these days and to, and to this kind of thinking and how it can help us. In this book, I try to make two related points. First, that if we want to contribute seriously to the development project, we need to further develop our peripheral vision to see what's happening in people's lives, to consciously, constantly question our assumptions and refine our theories. The kind of open listening that we did in the Kenya Financial Diaries helps with this. It can light at least a small candle in an otherwise dark room. When we do this, when we see more of the picture, we're really forced to grapple with and take seriously the systems um, that are creating the parameters in which individuals must build their lives. Often it is those systems that are holding people back from development. This book that we're launching today is based, um, as I've mentioned, on the Kenya Financial Diaries Project. And as Tamara mentioned, we did not invent this methodology. We are part of a tradition where we have learned from the lives of Stuart Rutherford in The Poor and Their Money, or Stuart along with Daryl Collins, Orlando Ruthven, and Jonathan Morda in uh, Portfolios of the Poor. These were really powerful pieces that gave us a whole new appreciation of what it meant to manage money in poverty. The financial diaries follow the same individuals over time to track their financial patterns in very careful detail to generate a deeper appreciation of their livelihood patterns and their financial needs. Here in Kenya, we had a team of about 15 full-time staff working with about 300 families spread across five areas of the country. And 
about every um, two weeks over a period of 18 months. For 12 of those months, our visits consisted of cataloging every single transaction that the family could recall in the intervening period. Every shilling of income, every shilling of expenditure, every purchase of chobi, as Ms. Mary tells us, um, and every movement in and out of savings, um, devices and credit devices. We captured the stories that went alongside these money decisions. And over time, we learned about people's struggles, their achievements, and their personal ambitions. We've had the lucky chance to follow up with this sample in 2015 and again to get in touch with them in 2020 as we try to really understand the impacts of COVID-19. Our study was commissioned by FSC Canada with additional funding from the Helen and Lydia Gates Foundation. Both funders were hoping that the insights from this work would help contribute to a new era of financial services that were, could ride on the rails of um, mobile finance and agent banking. For several years, we used the insights from this work to do exactly that. But even as we moved through that process, we realized that we had more to say. Things that weren't so directly about immediate financial solutions, but were rather about development itself. By following the money trail across the sample, we realized that experiences that sometimes seemed idiosyncratic at first often reflected broader patterns, common systemic barriers that were keeping people from fulfilling their full potential. While we were focused on how people were managing money, our participants were busy trying to live on little money. This book is an attempt to share those stories, to paint a picture of what it's like to build a rich and full life within the constraints facing ordinary candidates. Of course, finance enters all of those spaces and also interacts with these systems, reinforcing and sometimes challenging them, often without providers even knowing it. Very early in this project, I was with Nikesa, who you met in the video, um, and we were visiting a respondent uh, we call Mama Moses, who was very, very poor, and she was at the time on house arrest after being caught selling Chang'e. She was an HIV positive mother of five, and her husband didn't support the family. She had also taken in a friend of her daughter's who was an orphan and had nowhere else to go after she split up with her boyfriend. Chang'e was selling was the only way that Mama Moses felt she could earn enough to pay for secondary school fees for her kids. And even with that income, it wasn't enough. She had built up such a big debt at the school that her daughter had to stay after school to help work at the school and help work off the debt, which made it very hard for her to study when she came home late in the evenings to a house with no electricity. With few other options and being confined to home, Mama Moses kept growing Chaga. The day that I was visiting, Things were extremely strained. She owed her input supplier money, and her revenue of about 2,300 shillings had been taken by the police that day as a bribe when they arrested the motorbike rider who had gone to sell her last batch. Our respondent was ashamed of herself, not of an economy that failed to produce dignified legal work, not of a society that made it easy for her husband to walk away from his family obligations, not a system that made educating her children such a strain. In fact, nearly all of our respondents told us like, that they felt that they and their children could really make it big if they just worked hard enough, if they were just disciplined enough. There was an incredibly strong belief in the possibilities of a future that personal agency could build, while the realities of structural barriers were showing up everywhere. Our respondents were living in the illusion of freedom, the illusion that hard work and diligence were all that it took to make it big. This book is structured around a few key dimensions of people's lives where they face many structural unfreedoms. In the remainder of this talk, I want to give you just a very abbreviated sample of what we learned about these issues from our work and share a few ideas about what I think this could mean for the financial sector. David Rudman liked financial diaries to, quote, a good long stare at poverty. When we take a good long stare at how people are earning a living, labels like farmer or factory worker start to fall away against the reality that it, um, most people are doing very different forms of work simultaneously to generate a livable income. And they have to shift their strategies constantly in the face of economic turbulence. In the video you just saw, Agatha, who scrapes by on a very unpredictable cash transfer and a huge variety of casual jobs, 
um, tells us that 5,000 shillings or 10,000 shillings a month, which is about 50 to $100, would be a huge relief. Nimai Sham Zuri, she says, that's a good life. For many, probably most Kenyans, there is no such thing as a career, but a constant process of looking for money to survive and to match new expenditure needs as they arise. Not all of these uh, income generating strategies are equal. At the very bottom are these kinds of patchy, low paying piecework vibaruas that Agatha does. Things like fetching water, washing clothes, and collecting recyclables. Construction vibaruas are one more step up and they typically pay about 500 shillings a day. Although that's not fixed and it can vary. We've seen with COVID that this has gone down to as low as 200 shillings a day in Mombasa as so many men are out of work and eager to do anything for just one shilling. At the top of the income hierarchy is running a small business. And that was an aspirational livelihood for nearly everyone in our sample. This is what they believe will pull them out of poverty. And in fact, our data over time corroborate that theory. We see that those running businesses are more likely to increase their incomes and improve their financial health over time. But there's something you have to understand about these kinds of businesses. The typical business in our sample was extremely small, completely atomized, and low productivity. The medium business in our sample started with 600 shillings. That's about $6. Being able to start extremely small allowed um, these kinds of trade to be a bit of a safety net when things would um, go sideways. But these businesses have very low growth potential and many die as quickly as they're born. This was particularly true for businesses run by women who often felt forced to pull their capital out of their businesses for urgent expenditures on things like health, um, school fees for their kids and other demands of the family. Trading was mostly of the goods and services consumed by the low-income population near where people lived. Those selling vegetables in rural Maklini, for example, said that there's just no way to sell more than 300 shillings worth of vegetables in a day. There aren't enough additional people to buy those goods, and there are many other sellers to compete with. Selling into low-income informal networks, these vendors were also very susceptible to shocks. We saw very um, big and important contractions in small business income, especially in urban areas in the lead up to the 2013 elections. And we heard about similar issues, even longer lasting following the 2017 elections. COVID, of course, has been economically devastating for all, with a major driver being that contraction of demand at the low, income, low end of the market, where our respondents sell their goods and services. The main reason that so many people, like Mama Moses, make a living in Chang'e is because it is a relatively, um, it has relatively low capital requirements and there is sustained demand. In one area of Western Kenya, our respondents told us that especially if you are a widow, there is no other clear path to being able to care for your kids and pay for school fees. If your husband dies, you brew Chang'e. It's counterproductive to merely ban brewing without recognizing its central role in the livelihoods of likely hundreds of thousands of Kenyans with few other options. Rosemary, who you also met in the video, um, was able to leverage her Chang'a earnings into something that she's more proud of. She now sells Mutumba clothes um, and was able to construct some rental houses that um, outside of COVID times typically bring her some stable monthly income. The limits of demand mean that specialization is not a viable uh, route to prosperity. Instead, you can add more to your aggregate income only through diversification. So for example, Christopher in a small town in Rift Valley started a sp uh, spices and cereals business with some um, stock that was given to him on consignment from an in-law. First, he built his local client base. And when he had exhausted that, he started going to market days outside of town to sell the same things. Then he got a loan and bought a motorbike. And he added one motorbike at a time to his fleet until he had three bodas running around town. Then he took more uh, loans and bought a piece of land. Then another loan to build rental houses. There was no way that Christopher could have sold more cereals in his area. And geographic expansion would have been a management disaster. He grew by selling a different range of things and increasingly moving into more capital intensive enterprises. The centrality of business to upward mobility brings us to the central money management challenge for low-income people. 
And that is the trade-off between spending money, stretching money to deal with income and spending fluctuations, and putting money aside to invest. Money comes in with a high frequency, often daily. Needs are always waiting. Many people are living below the poverty line, so by definition, they're not earning enough to meet their basic needs, which means there's always an expenditure that needs to be made. But they know that tomorrow, income could be even less than today, or some expense like healthcare might pop up. So some money needs to be put aside to deal with that risk. In our sample, this liquid savings was um, relatively small. It was some extra money that was stuffed under the mattress, held in M-Pesa, um, or stuck in some other kind of hiding place. This was the money to stretch. You also know, if you're in this situation, that the only way out is to invest. So other money has to constantly be channeled into illiquid forms that help you build up an investable sum, to, uh, or to access an investable sum through a loan to do big things, like expand a business, buy a piece of land, or get your child through secondary school, hoping that they'll one day get a good job and boost the whole family's watch. Chamas, or savings groups, were really great at this. That's what the money to grow. Both to stretch and to grow, people have to exercise the daily discipline of saving, even when they don't have enough to meet their basic needs today. We often saw that people struggled to cope with big shocks, even when they had savings, since that savings might be illiquid, set aside for some planned investment. Expanded digital credit has helped to ease some of these painful trade-offs. Still, we have to now be concerned about the potential oversupply of this high-cost credit, and we should recognize that more systemic intervention, like reliable um, universal health coverage and truly free education, could do even more to ease the difficult trade-offs that scarcity forces the poor to make in their financial lives. Scarcity has a profound impact on the life trajectories of young people as well. We saw incredibly bright students pushed out of good schools when their parents could not consistently come up with the money for fees. We saw these young people worry, watching their parents really struggling to come up with school fees. And that, plus the ever-constant temptation for quick money, lured many young men out of school and into gangs and other criminal activity. For girls, um, a pause in education too often meant an early pregnancy, tethering them to a universe of opportunities um, that were much smaller than what they or their parents had hoped. In our work, it was really impossible to overlook the differences of these experiences between men and women. When we met Millie, she was a new mother, having recently formalized her marriage to her husband. Millie had been staying with an uncle in Eldoret who was very keen on sending her to college. He was employing her as an M-Pesa teller at his shop until he could get the money together to send her away. So he was furious when he found out that she had gotten pregnant with a lorry driver in town. He wanted her to have more options. Millie quickly moved out of her, her uncle's house and in with her new husband. She was really excited at first. This meant some new independence and the chance to be a mother. But a couple of years in, she realized her husband was unfaithful. He would call and say that he would be home late from a work trip, that there was a problem with the lorry. And this was happening more and more. Once when she called, a woman answered the phone. Her husband's colleagues confirmed her fears. She asked her husband's relatives to intervene, and they lured him out to the family compound to help um, sort, of, sort things out. They told him that he should change his ways, that he had obligations to his wife and his young child. And he nodded along. But when they got home, Millie said, he was furious at her for having gotten the family involved. If she wanted him to be faithful, she should agree to have more children and right away, to be more fully his wife. She wasn't quite ready. After her first child, she had um, a birth control implant inserted into her arm. She was hoping to have a second baby only once the first went to school. Her husband had been talking to friends who told him where he should look to find his wife's implant in her arm if she indeed had one. So one night he came home, scanned her arms, found the implant, and tried to claw it out himself. She begged him to stop, and the next morning she went to the clinic and had it removed. As Millie told me this story, she was smiling and rocking uh, an infant baby girl swaddled in a pink blanket. I was upset at the time, she said, but children are a blessing. When young men leave school, they often get to travel a bit. They're dabbling in different livelihoods, 
following opportunities where they might have a connection to some kind of work. It is a struggle, but it's also a kind of exposure that young women rarely get. Having children to care for limits women's ability to enter the workforce or continue their education. And with only limited autonomy over when and how many children they have, those choices are further constrained. And while women have limited choices over the shapes of their families and therefore their own livelihoods, we saw that women, money in marriage was typically divided, with men and women controlling only the funds that they directly have. When women earn less, they have less say about how money is used, particularly for big future-oriented investments, even though priorities between men and women on these issues differ pretty strongly. Nearly all families told us, for example, that school fees are the financial obligation of children's fathers. Mothers were not to question whether that money was saved and would be available when school opened, but often the women discovered that their husbands didn't have the money. It hadn't been earned or was spent on something that the husband valued more at the time, and that might be a business expense, electricity, land, livestock, and not uncommonly, a second family. But women's high prioritization of education meant that they often dug deep um, to find some way to back up and make those payments. They would pull money out of their own savings, out of their business capital, by borrowing from traumas and microfinance institutions, or by selling small assets, often chicken and goats. The division of household financial responsibilities and the necessity of bringing your own money to the table to have a say in big decisions has important implications. So, for example, a number of women told us that they lost power when their husbands got formal jobs. Before their husbands had formal jobs, both of them were paying for some of the day-to-day -day needs within the household. But once their husbands had a monthly paycheck, um, they got to get all of that money in a lump sum. So suddenly, women were spending more and more of their own money on managing the household, which meant they had left less to save. And when it came time for a big decision, they had zero voice in how that money could be used. Tensions within the family often caused um, women especially huge amounts of anguish and stress. While burdened by children and domestic responsibilities, they were not free to work the same way as men. And yet men's responsibilities to provide, especially in the long term, were only very loosely enforced. Healthcare was a whole separate realm of financial stress. We did not really need financial diaries to tell us this. The 2018 Household Health and Expenditure Utilization Survey shows that 1 million Kenyans are pushed into poverty every year by out-of-pocket health expenditures, and that most of this comes from outpatient care. It shows us that we also need to pay attention to spending that doesn't happen when it should. The share of sick Kenyans not seeking health care rose from women dying in childbirth in Kenya are about 1 in 69, which is slightly better than the regional average of 1 in 58, but still more deadly than COVID-19. In the diaries, we find the stories that help us understand what's happening. We saw that even with outpatient care, poor quality um, of treatment and diagnostics meant that a visit that might cost 200 shillings at the first instance was often compounded several times over as people went back to hospitals and clinics several times to try to get a correct diagnosis. Those delays often resulted in deteriorating health, lost incomes, and in some cases, death. This is a quality tax on the poor that undermines initiatives like free outpatient care, particularly when public facilities do not have medicine on hand. Even in the face of initiatives to lower care costs, such as free maternity care, we see that management problems can make these initiatives fail in practice with devastating consequences. One of our respondents in Coast, for example, was really banking on this free maternity care, but when she went into labor, public hospitals were on strike. She needed an emergency C-section and was forced to come up with 60,000 shillings instantaneously to pay the private hospital to save her and her baby's life. Sandra, near Eldoret, received free antenatal care visits, which she was very happy about, but when the checkups revealed that she needed a blood transfusion, she was asked to pay 50,000 shillings for that, about $500. Her husband decided that that was too much money, that they should just take their chances. She miscarried at seven months and needed 45,000, about $450 for emergency treatment. 
with no other choice at that point, her husband raised the money by, from his savings, by selling a cow, and by borrowing the balance from friends. Her loss was devastating, and she blames herself. She says it was her fault that she wasn't able to earn more money. If she had more money, she could have ensured better nutrition for herself and been able to help pay for that transfusion. We saw the life-changing impacts of losses like Sandra's or of a boy in Western who became incontinent after an injury and has since dropped out of school, unable to get the kind of treatment that would help him live a normal life. We saw what it meant for a family when poor medical care led to death. Financing healthcare is not easily done through insurance or health credit. For one, health insurance is better at covering low probability events. Even NHIF at the time of our initial study covered only inpatient care. But we saw in the diaries, as in um, the larger Kenya Health Expenditure Survey, that a huge burden of out-of-pocket expenditures are actually on outpatient care. The ordinary burden of basic care is itself too high. It's, not, it's only a partly a problem of poor timing, which would lend itself to a credit solution. The extra challenge is that the poor face many risks, not just health, but in agriculture, in the loss of a main income earner, in fire, and in other kinds of um, disasters. In already constrained budgets, it's simply not possible to afford to cover all of the risks that they face. And even when they do invest in insurance, we saw that it does not always work for them. When Evans brought his newborn, hospital, newborn to the hospital um, in 2017, his infant had a sinus blockage that was causing him to stop breathing. So he had to go to Kenyatta for surgery. Evans had been paying NHIF for the family for years from his um, chips and mature business. The cashier at the hospital ripped up his paperwork in front of his face when he could not produce the newborn's birth certificate. Mind you, it was a newborn. He had to come up with 32,000 cash to cover the hospital bill, which accrued an extra 1,700 shillings every day while he tried to raise that money. It took him three days, and after that incident, he stopped uh, paying for NHIF. What's the point, he asked. I can hardly blame Evans for moving slowly on that birth certificate. It took one respondent in Makwini seven separate trips to the office in Wote and a bribe to get the birth certificate for her son. Evans since applied for the birth certificate once the baby was discharged. He is still waiting. It's been more than two years. One chapter in the book looks at our research participants' experiences of citizenship, including these kinds of hurdles they jump through to access things like basic documentation, but also the ways that their lives are impacted by police harassment, the significant economic disruption triggered by elections, and the insecurity that the state is unable to manage in their neighborhoods. As COVID curfews were put in place nationwide, many of our respondents expressed relief. Finally, the police were around, cutting down on the rape, robbery, and violence that plagued their neighborhoods. In their day-to-day -day lives, for many, government is a risk to cope with, often to avoid, not a partner in Mandaleo development. To be fair, our respondents didn't expect much more. When Violet moved her brilliant son out of the national school and into a local day school with subpar teaching and very few opportunities for its graduates, she didn't curse the state. This was her failure, she thought, as a single mother, a widow, and a community health worker. To get him as far as she did, she had cozied up to politicians in campaign mode, who, who occasionally handed out the extra cash she needed to buy just one more term. She only earned about 5,500 shillings per month in total income, but she reasoned that somehow she should have been able to find the 37,000 um, per year in fees that she needed just for him, while she had two children in secondary school at the same time. Last time I saw Violet, um, she told me that her son's grades had plummeted when she moved him to the local day school. His future dreams dashed. He had basically given up on school. And when I saw him, he, he showed me his guinea pigs. He was starting to raise those and sell them um, to the teachers in the neighborhood. Meanwhile, Violet pulled up her arm to show me an orange-sized growth in her armpit. It had been growing for years, but she hasn't had the money to get it removed. She had been trying to prioritize school fees. We cannot expect that these problems of poverty to disappear magically with growth. In the past several years, we've seen increasingly troubling indications 
of growth in Kenya without shared prosperity. In 2019, formal job creation fell to a seven-year low. Informal work is growing faster than formal work, and despite nearly 6% annual GDP growth between 2016 and 2019, financial health has declined for most Kenyans in the FINAXA study from FSD Kenya, CBK, and KMBS. We've already heard about these worrying trends around the increasing um, difficulty that Kenyans are facing just trying to find out healthcare. Amidst all of this, ordinary people are still trying to invest their way out of poverty. They do believe they can make it on their own, but that is an illusion of agency that is only partly true. The point of all of this is not to leave you in despair. Instead, I think these stories invite us to imagine new kinds of intervention. Traditionally, the ideas of finance implicitly reinforce um, the ideas of personal agency. Your savings reflect your character. We call it credit worthiness. It's about how much you hustle, your commitment to repay. What would it mean for practitioners in finance to see and engage with the systems that I've been talking about? I'm very encouraged that FSD Kenya and the FSD network more broadly are asking these questions. They are, for example, developing more work that brings finance closer to livelihoods and the real economy. They're paying much closer um, attention to outcomes like financial health rather than account ownership. And they're doing a lot of careful thinking about segmentation in the market and how finance might better fit with people, for people with a wide range of different kinds of needs and constraints. But I think the implications could be even broader. So for the sake of time today, I'm just gonna offer a few ideas. And I hope our panel will have a lot more um, in their discussion. First, in retail finance, I think much more could be done to dismantle structural gender barriers. Financial services today are not neutral. For example, on what criteria do our algorithms assess credit risk? And how are those gendered if they rely heavily on, for example, mobile gambling data, or the geographic spread of contacts in your address book. In Uganda, a study I helped colleagues with found that loan officers were more likely to conceal loan costs from female borrowers. Are financial institutions policing themselves on things like this? Recognizing structural inequalities facing women, I might ask, um, are we actually providing efficient and fair recourse mechanisms for low literacy and low mobility populations? Do our female clients actually need financial literacy training or do couples need joint support and financial planning? When we're creating a payment channel for household production on things like tea or coffee, other cash crops, should we consider designing split payments um, so that both spouses are getting a share? What kind of supports are we providing clients registering and enforcing their wills? Might we even imagine new partnerships that matter for women's financial lives? For example, could financial sector providers partner with contraception providers or agrovets to, to protect women's livelihoods and assets in the same vein as bankers have partnered with home builders, car dealers, and even tractor sellers? In the health space, I think we need to recognize the limits of private financing solutions for the poor. Once we do that, we can ask, what is the role of M-Pesa and private banks in supporting efficient UHC rollout? How might we better align financing solutions with care quality through, for example, increased disease surveillance um, and secure electronic health records? How can we best fit with stakeholders and making these systems actually work consistently and reliably? My third idea is for people like me. For those of us um, who are international, can we do more to restore agency to the beneficiaries? of our interventions. When foreigners, including do-gooder consultants and researchers like me, donors and even foreign private companies come to Kenya, we often sell our ideas directly to governments as if they are purely technical and apolitical. At the same time, people like me have little long-term accountability for the impact of our interventions. Financial diaries show us just how important it is to amplify the voices of ordinary people and to support their agency in the ways that policies are developed and implemented. Instead of rushing out solutions, what if we developed new approaches to partnership that genuinely reinforce democratic processes rather than circumventing them? What if we instead embraced slow policy? 
In our historical moment, many of the advances in development are tech or data-based. We're talking about credit bureaus, digital identity, e-government, electronic health records, and those come with many new risks, some of which won't be anticipated by people like me who don't fully understand the local context and who don't have to live with the consequences. We should at the very least ensure that citizens have a powerful voice in key decisions around how these new systems develop and are managed. And finally, some thoughts about building opportunities for youth. Often those troubled by um, issues around youth unemployment have targeted interventions at young people themselves, including training, access to credit, and preferential treatment for government tenders. But if we zoom out, we see that youth are trying to make, to make it in a system that isn't ready to absorb them. Perhaps the questions we should be asking are how do we keep kids in school longer? Particularly for girls, this is about harvesting the tremendous social, not just economic, returns to a longer education. Second, how do we create career paths for young people as employees within firms where they can become world-class professionals? We will always need entrepreneurs, but even more than that, we need firms. Firms with a kind of productivity offer the productivity gains that provide a long-term platform for Kenya's growth and that can continuously build human capital through actual career paths that allow continuous learning and um, allow us a chance to build on the tremendous investments Kenya has already made in opening up tertiary education. Being part of this Kenya Financial Diaries project has left me in awe of what people have overcome and what so many have already achieved. There actually is some space for modest progress at a household level, even if that progress is uneven and not linear, but much more is possible. What if we all stopped being content with quote, low hanging fruit solutions with quick wins and small marginal gains? There's nothing wrong with those kinds of interventions in and of themselves. The trouble is that the kind, that kind of thinking sometimes inhibits us from doing the hard work of changing systems. They have been a substitute for building freedom. Finance and technology could be powerful tools in this fight, but that depends on how we use them. Neither this talk or this book are the final word on any of these questions, but I hope as we close, you have some new ideas. Perhaps you have a better sense of where your own work fits in these systems that govern people's day-to-day -day lives. Seeing those systems and working to refashion them is the work of a society. I want to close with a final um, quote from Amartya Sen in his book, Development is Freedom. The freedom of agency that we individually have is inescapably qualified and constrained by the social, political, and economic opportunities that are available to us. To counter the problems that we face, we have to see individual freedom as a social commitment. Thank you very much, Julie, for that moving speech and all the insights that you've been sharing with us um, through the Financial Diaries process that you captured in the book, but also in the Financial Diaries process that we've been going through during the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you very much, Julie, for that. Um, so now we're going to switch gears a bit and we're going to start a panel. My name is Anzat Sawara. I am the economist at FSD Kenya. And so I'm just going to welcome the panel. And as I read your name, please just make your your way to the stage. We have the honor of having a very distinguished panel um, with very deep expertise and very well respected in their fields. Um, our first panelist is Dr. James Mwangi. He is the Group Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group Holdings and the Executive Chairman. He has five honorary doctorate degrees in recognition of his positive impact um, on the Kenyan society. And in fact, this year, he was honored with the prestigious 2020 Oslo Business Peace uh, Business for Peace Award, which is always also described as the Nobel Peace Prize for Peace. He has also been um, on the global front, uh, won numerous awards from the Global Vision Award, uh, the Award of the Year for CEO, the Innovation Leader Award, the African Bank of the Year Award. But he also gives his time on several boards um, at the Global Advisory Council, the MasterCard Advisory Board, and he also teaches. He's a guest lecturer at Stanford, Columbia, MIT, Harvard, and Lagos Business School. Welcome, Dr. Mandy. Our second panelist is Deborah uh, Maloa. She is the Chief Business Development Officer at Safaricom. 
Deborah Mano um, um, is responsible for developing Safaricom strategic direction and preparing Safaricom from the, for the future. She joined Safaricom um, last year, having previously served at Smith client as a general manager, and her other roles have included the vice president of personal care community Unilever Africa, as well as director of innovations at Diageo East Africa. Um, she was also honored by the Marketing Society of Kenya, and she also sits on several boards, including the Advisory Council and the Women's World Banking. Welcome, Deborah, to the panel for the summer. Our third panelist is Isaac Awondo. He is the chairman of NCBA Bank Kenya. He has over 39 experience, years of experience in finance and banking sectors spanning Europe and Eastern Africa. He previously worked with BDO Binder Hamlin, Nation Media Group, and Standard Chartered in various senior roles. Um, he's the chairman also of the Kenya Airports Authority, NCBA, and the Council of Riyadh University. He is also a member of the advisory board of CAPSA, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. And finally, we have Wangari Nganga. She is a technical advisor for Universal Healthcare and the executive office of the president. She has an extensive understanding and experience on both organizational level and in terms of the delivery of health services in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, she's also um, has a passion in designing and implementing tailored solutions. Um, she's currently working on the national health policies in Kenya and trying to marry technical design within the political economy. And she has a master's degree in health and public policy in health and policy planning from the London School of Hygiene. So welcome. So first of all, so can, can, can everyone hear me? I hope that they can hear me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for making time. You can take off your masks. I've been, I've been told that because we are observing social distancing, people will be able to see your mouths today. <laughs> this is so welcome. So I'm just going to just get straight into the panel because I'm really excited to hear all of the insights that you bring to the table. So I'll start with you. Uh, Dr. Um, first of all, I want to sort of hear your um, what really resonated with you from the financial diaries, um, if you got to read the book, but also just from the, the talk that Julie gave. And I really want to hear it from the experience that you have, the very deep experience you have on financing small and medium enterprises. I think you heard someone in the video mention that. I just wanted to hear sort of your thoughts on is it okay? The sound, the audience. Talking about how to handle brings out uh, the broken part of the world and the economies. And the timing of releasing this book uh, is very special because COVID on a global scale have exposed what is not what. But people are looking for empirical data to confirm that. And there could it be a better uh, empirical data than what is contained in this book? Because it's researchable, it has all the data. It's not about statistics, it's about life. And essentially, then this book that uh, would help us to build the world better, find a purpose in changing lives and livelihoods, so that uh, people don't live the indignified lives uh, that have been exposed uh, by the COVID situation, where 90 million people have fallen below the poverty line uh, in Africa alone. We're talking about Africa, but this is uh, this book brings the picture light home because we are talking about voices that we can recognize, villages that we all know. So it's not fiction; it's reality. But I like uh, chapter two even more uh, because um, it brings out the big contradiction that we live in Africa of massive resources or natural resources and yet abject poverty sitting side by side. But that chapter also brings the hope that uh, enterprise, whether small or micro or medium enterprises, can be the engine of reversing that balance. Uh, but it then uh, paints the pictures 
the government, in particular for government, that biashara ni maisha. Business is about life. So when we really talk about business, we are talking about livelihood. And that distinction and clarity, I think it's something that has been brought out very, very well uh, in the book. And hopefully appropriate policies would be, then be developed uh, to really institutionalize. It also paints the picture of uh, the greatest opportunity of investing to formalize uh, small micro business. And what opportunities in terms of uh, jobs and markets uh, for value chains that could be created. We, if we only invested a little bit, both in policy and an upbringing environment and government for Well, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for those insights. And I want to just give up on that maybe that uh, you know, you obviously sitting at Safaricom. And again, Safaricom was one of the institutions mentioned there, such a very distinguished set that I hope you are going to be with us. So as you're reflecting on the book and the tour of the lecture, I really want you to share some of the key patterns that you see in how a lot of, you know, normal average of the low income kids interface with the sort of the, you know, the community of policy. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think the book was extremely insightful, uh, going beyond just the quantitative impact of living on a little to actually addressing the question of human dignity. But I thought it also offered great insights in terms of what exactly people are going through and how they're actually uh, getting behind these economic challenges. Um, for ourselves, when you look at the key patterns there, um, M-Pesa was, was actually launched in 2007, and it was launched on the same principle of how people struggled to actually send money to another person without impacting, for example, the economic cost of that. You actually had to physically go and give somebody the money that you, were, you, were, you meant to send through. Um, and addressing that issue of peer-to-peer -peer sending was one of the breakthroughs on M-Pesa because it saved on time, it saved on cost, and actually enabled people to send money right through. So that pattern of peer-to-peer -peer still remains true today. Um, secondly, you look at, from the low-income perspective, the low-income tends to be net recipients. And when you look at uh, migration of money, urban, rural is still true today. Most of people working in, and Julie really actually attributed a bit in her book on that, People working in the cities, etc., sending money to the rural areas, that remains a key pattern today, where you see the urban, mig uh, rural migration of, of money and the shifts of money. You're seeing that in M-Pesa. And then lastly, I would say, when you look at micro-lending and the ability to access uh, credit, and M-Pesa enabled that um, in, in products that we co-partnered with uh, uh, CBA and the Shwari in 2012, KCB in 2015. Before, people would take about three weeks. You needed your ID, you needed heavy documentation. Uh, financial inclusion was under 20%. But today, with just your phone, you're able to actually access credit. And around 21 million Kenyans now can access credit through M-Pesa, through um, Shwari, through um, KCB and M-Pesa. So that has enabled an unlocking of credit access. And that's the continuous pattern that we're seeing today. Thank you. So let me let me move to you guys. I mean, obviously, uh, you are an experienced banker, and you understand, you know, how particularly the banking sector in Kenya works. And one of the broad concerns is that often doesn't interface very well with the low income on Kenyans. So I just want you to explain, as you're reflecting on the book again, as you're sitting in a formal financial banking institution, how do you tend to see uh, low income Kenyans interface? with the products and services that you do tend to get. Um, Thank you very much, uh, uh, I enjoyed reading the book, and uh, I think uh, the book brought out uh, an interesting perspective about, uh, about life in Kenya. And before I come to the specific question, I just, it's a reflection, which I think was very important uh, for me. Uh, I think the fact that uh, the book uh, brought out uh, an element of, uh, of dignity, uh, which everybody is looking for in life. Uh, we recognize that a lot of uh, people in this country uh, survive uh, through the informal sector uh, without uh, structures which are actually enabling them uh, to survive. 
Uh, what do I mean? They basically rely on their wit and uh, their ability to connect uh, for them to be able to survive with very, very little being done from a formal basis uh, to enable them. Yet, they are actually spending time and ensuring that uh, they don't go out and beg. Uh, a lot of the cases uh, which, uh, uh, which were highlighted were people who were trying to do something uh, to enable themselves live from day to day. And I think that's really truly the story of Kenya and the story uh, of, uh, of Africa. Uh, on, in any part of Kenya or any part of Africa you travel to, you will find that without the informal sector, actually a lot of the countries would not uh, really make true, uh, true progress. So I think that the book brings, up, it brings that out uh, very, very strongly. If I now begin to relate it uh, to the banking, uh, to the banking uh, side of things, I think uh, critical to recognize that uh, a lot of these people, despite the fact that uh, they are living off little, still think about uh, putting something aside uh, for the rainy day. So creates a huge uh, saving, uh, uh, saving culture. Uh, which exists, uh, which has been built over time uh, from uh, originally putting money in, in a little team, uh, putting money in post offices, and now putting money in, uh, in a form or saving your money within the form. We've seen that uh, <coughs> uh, very fully uh, occur within uh, uh, the partnership we have with uh, uh, Safaricom on uh, on uh, on ensure where actually a lot more people save than uh, than poor money. So so I think it says something about uh, what the use of uh, modern financial tools can actually do to facilitate uh, poorer people uh, access, have access to financial services. I think the second thing we access to credit. Is, uh, is something uh, for many years, many of us took for uh, Through some of the research we did uh, with FSD when we were setting up, uh, uh, setting up in Shore, one of the key messages which kept on uh, coming out all the time with it, to everybody we talked to was the fact that uh, they wanted to be able to access credit with dignity. And what do I mean? Dignity means that I don't fill a form and go into a, into a bank and run the risk of being told no in front of many people. Dignity for a lot of these people meant, tell me no, yes, and we tell a lot of people no from my investment perspective, but nobody else knows that you do. And I think that uh, what technology is able to do is to which is required in a lot of uh, in a lot of these markets. When I think about uh, the ordinary Mamambog and look at it from a trading point of view, the ordinary Mamambog, when you look at uh, the lending we do on uh, on insurance, uh, close to 40% of lending takes place between the hour of uh, four in the morning and six in the morning. Now, why is that taking place? Because a lot of Kenyan uh, traders and people who uh, are fruits, vegetables, and all that, who are coming in to borrow five, between a thousand uh, to five thousand shillings, are going to uh, various marketplaces across the country and uh, accessing credit. And we ask them, oftentimes, you borrow this money uh, in the morning, you want to pay it in the evening, why don't you want uh, to stay with the money uh, for a long time? I borrowed it for a purpose, I want to complete my day, Go to sleep knowing I don't know anybody, anything, yeah. and start again the following day. What are they looking for? Certainty that if they want credit, they can access it. And I think that's very, very important. And that, that I think, has been one of the biggest uh, uh, transformation in this market. I think led by uh, uh, James Mwangi, I think, transformed uh, banking into this country in very, very fundamental ways. And uh, I'm sure uh, Safaricom working with us in basically using technology uh, to provide uh, solutions, which I believe a lot of these people are looking for. Thank you. And I think we'll now talk to you about it because I think often the uncertainty that makes it difficult for people to make great healthy financial lives is the fact that health is a consistent shock that they're always being in. Um, so I think, you know, as we reflect on the book, 
I really want to get an understanding of the strategies that you see Kenyans use to meet what is a very big looming uncertainty in their lives, which is either they get sick or breadwinner gets sick. What are some of the strategies that you see Kenyans do that can be better given the lack of university? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, thank you um, to Tamara and the team at FST for inviting us for, for this talk. Um, I'll take on exactly that last point that I was mentioning uh, uncertainty. So people are looking for certainty, and that's exactly what you can get with your help. And uh, the most important reflection for me from this book is a point that Julie made um, during her lecture that it's probably time we have a fundamental paradigm shift in how we finance social infrastructure. All through the financial diaries, a lot of talk, a lot of voices we are hearing, not too much on physical infrastructure. Nobody complained about how the road was built. Nobody complained about how the dam was built, but they complained that there was not certainty that every time I needed healthcare, I got it in the right quantity and exactly when I needed it. It's a time we think about it. Another fundamental point that I, I want to reflect on, also Julie mentioned uh, during her, is a lot of the, the poor feel that it is their responsibility. They feel shame when they cannot afford social infrastructure which we expect that government should be providing. This is where I'm going to come in. It's not often that political ambition matches right up with a social fabric need. This is universal health coverage. What have people been doing? One, and very sadly, is foregoing care. I want us to come that as a strategy to finance care. The lack of care, and it has detrimental quality. We must not forget it. We can't assume just because the spending is low, and I think this point came up very clearly in the health chapter. Clearly, you can see the chapter, I know why I that. Um, very clearly in the health chapter, some spending as little as 50 shillings. It's very expensive when you don't have it. Some spending, I think the mean was something like uh, um, 3,000 a year. I mean, and it sounds doable, you know, if, if you put the effort, as we've just discussed previously. What happens when you don't have it now? And this is what happens when you need help. So I want to come to foregoing care as one. One very expensive way of meeting financial costs. One. Two, borrowing. You borrow from anyone, anywhere, however you can. From your uncle, from your friend, you borrow. Three, you show up, you get care, and then get detained because you couldn't pay the fees. Four, you sell your assets. And I want us to come to each one of them. More and more, since the financial diaries were done until now, a lot of it has changed. A lot of gambling policies which have benefited majority, but to some extent. What I love about this book is that it forces me out of the quantitative analytics. We spoke about this before we walked in. It forces me out of that space from just looking at the numbers. Out of pocket spending in health in Kenya is 26%. What does that come to? It comes to about 118 billion. That's how much we spend on health. Let's disaggregate that against the wealth of green titles. How much are we okay? When we say we've got 20% access to any child from the country, let's disaggregate that and go into wealth quintiles. In the wealthiest quintile, 88% of Kenyans have any child. In the poorest quintile, 4. 4%. So we need to really, really think about it. And I'll give this example um, that I like to give in other spaces. And you mention that I'm also a lecturer. Everyone knows that. <laughs> So I'm going to let you first. Um, pick a road, pick a super highway. I was born on that side. I saw the, the new road we built. I didn't see the old one we built. I saw the new road we built. When it was built, I was in medical school. Uh, and so the financing that I, Wangare Nyanga, contributed towards Pika Road was indirect tax. But the bread I bought from the canteen, I went to this school, by the way, very proud alumnus. The, the bread I bought at the canteen, that was my contribution in terms of tax, and then they paid for that road. My seniors here paid a lot more. Those who are yet to be born, or those who are born five years uh, behind me, paid less than I did. Today, on that road, my senior James Wangi cannot use more than one lane. He uses the one lane that I can use, that Anzese you can use, that all the voices we've had from the Living on Little Book can use. Why don't we think about it that way? That because James got to pay a little bit more, then I get to benefit. I'll pay for a little bit longer. And for that person who can't pay 
as much as I did back then and still continue to pay to maintain the road can still access it. One lane for one person doesn't matter if you have 10 cars or you have no lanes. One lane. Can we think about how to fundamentally change how we finance social infrastructure and then give those who are struggling every day, living, as Julie said, when we're busy tracing, cataloging each expenditure, each source of income, they were living. So let's live, let them live. And they've got the right module, the right attitude, the Kenyans being Kenyan, characteristic. But I should be there, and we are. And as, as you know, about three weeks ago, we launched the Universal Health Coverage Program, biometric registration we're targeting in one million Kenyans. And that hard question comes. Everyone is one ICU admission away from poverty. Just one. So let's think about how do we fundamentally change how we finance our social infrastructure. And let me just pick on that to go back to you, Dr. Mangi, because you you were talking a lot about COVID-19 already in your initial mm -hmm. response, and I really want to tap into this because the book was pre-COVID, and we've been doing some work as I perceive with Julie and others on the impact of COVID. And so I really want to uh, get a sense of the impact that you've seen, um, particularly on the, the SMEs that uh, finance are financed through equity bankers at first. But I also want to see what effective coping strategies have you seen, uh, particularly if those that already had um, loans that had been provided by equity bank to whatever you know, business that perhaps they were running or personal expense. What effective coping strategies have you seen Kenyans demonstrate during COVID-19 to, to sort of meet this exogenous shock that they're facing? Uh, thank you. I think the impact of COVID uh, is very important. For the SMEs, because we are interacting with them uh, maybe on a daily basis, the biggest uh, challenge has been the uh, social sector. And uh, uh, essentially, it boils down to what was just said uh, here uncertainty. And it goes beyond uncertainty to fear. Uh, one we talk about at the moment, all the hospitals are yeah. Doctors are talking about uh, going on strike in 21 days. And that trickled down to uncertainty. What would happen if my child got COVID? We're in a single room where there is no shared shared distance. It means all of us are prepared to infection. We can't afford medical care, and that then boils to you, uh, a line of uncertainty for them. And once you move into a, uh, uh, and you enter into that space, it's like you start a speed. The mind stops uh, working, uh, posting, and uh, you, you tend to be in a vicious uh, cycle or thought process. But for those who have little businesses, it's the government, uh, it's not the health issue, but it's even bigger. It's uh, the, uh, the government mechanism of coping or stopping COVID, of lockdown, restaurants, uh, kiosks, uh, traffic, uh, or, or public transport. is closed for three months, like when I hope it was not done. And the issue is uh, this was the provider, this is a new business, was the provider of life. So essentially, for that family, hybrid is lost. Hybrid means if they are uh, the sickness, uh, the family will not be able to afford help. It also means that uh, if uh, schools are open, they won't be able to take their children, even on online digital learning. They, they're not able. Leave alone food. That what we are talking about is now we go beyond poverty to the indignity of food party because they are exposed. It's not that they, they slept hungry, but everybody in the village knows their children are not going to school and are not going to hospital when they, they are sick. That is the level of indignity uh, this has really brought. So it's not more financial. It's about lives, uh, that the quality of lives uh, uh, that uh, people are living. This third one is the future of uh, their businesses are threatened. They are threatened because while government stopped uh, uh, through the protocols, uh, for instance, uh, let's uh, uh, lock down sectors, and, and the government didn't do it directly. 
But if I was in a tour uh, business or travel business, and I have a van that was taking a tourist uh, to uh, Masai Mara, the day the airspace was closed, my business was naturally closed. And the question is, while well, that uh, business is shut, my needs that were being provided by the business have not been shut. So then what we have created is a disconnect between uh, incomes and expenses. We have expenses without streams of income. So essentially, what has families turned to is eating the capital. So the liquidity that big businesses like what Isaac is managing is preserving liquidity and capital. These livelihoods have started eating the seed, which is the liquidity of the business and the capital. And essentially, they have driven their businesses to, in, uh, to insolvency or to solvency. And the question then is, uh, what happens to livelihood? We are seeing a significant uh, degeneration or a dec decline in quality of life and livelihood. The fourth one is the future. We have eaten the seeds. When uh, COVID is over, what will we plant? The, 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 the question is, again, so essentially, COVID might be with us for a year or two or three, but it might destroy generations because uh, the savings that uh, took uh, families three, four generations to build are being wiped uh, by consumption. The, and if the businesses are open, we have seen uh, the disposable income, the consumer power, has already shrunk significantly. And we can see it on all transactions. But the question is, they can't make break-even point. The businesses can no longer sustain the quality of life of that family. So that is the scenario. And then it becomes worse. If those uh, who are living on little had supplemented little by borrowing, and the bank might uh, be kind and generous and uh, provide even a one-year moratorium. But the bank is not waiving the loan. It's not waiving interest. So essentially, we are compounding the loans through compounded interest. Rate. The burden has become bigger. So when the environment is big, as the bank is not so enjoying, so it's not the Again, We'll have that crisis uh, we, we experienced of a day talking, I don't borrow because they will come even for my life. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's, that's why we said we might have created a vicious cycle that the gains we have made for the last 25 years that Africa have uh, reflected positive GDP growth rate might be eroded in less than a year. And I have no doubt. We have lost five to 10 years uh, of uh, progress uh, in terms of development. Let me stop there because I am sure Isaac wants to, no. to make contributions. <laughs> uh, I, you, he's looking at me as if, James, why are you holding the mic? Oh, please. Thank you. He'll get his chance. And, and I, I just wanted to just get Deborah to, to sort of you know, echo and, and get her insights on COVID-19 and how she's seeing it playing out in terms of the I mean, I really want to see it and get a good sense of pre-COVID, what were the patterns of interaction that Kenyans were having, for example, with person, which is known around the world. And then post-COVID, what is that looking like for you now? I think James has really made some interesting points around the long-term asset destruction that we're seeing um, with people sort of eating the seed, as he said. In your view, given the massive sort of uh, user base that you have, what have you been seeing? Uh, when you look at it, without, without question, COVID has had significant and detrimental effects to economies, to livelihoods, to lives, um, globally and locally. Um, and when you look at it from a uh, perspective of pre-COVID and post-COVID, let's say from an MPESA uh, perspective, um, you always have to look at it on, on, on two dimensions. Um, the economic impact, okay, for simplicity, I look at it in quarters. Um, uh, from an economic perspective, from April, May, June, the government, we had a lockdown, imposed it because health had to come first. So there was a lockdown at that particular uh, point. Uh, curfews were also introduced. 
um, which meant economic activity significantly contracted, as uh, Dr. Mangi had mentioned over here, significantly contracted in that period of time. And uh, we had to respond in, from a perspective of seeing how positively impact livelihoods against that challenge. And that's when the zero tariffing came into play. So, uh, for example, on M-Pesa, uh, peer-to-peer transfers, anything under 1,000 shillings was zero tariff. Um, on the merchant tills, Lipa and M-Pesa, uh, also under 1,000 was uh, zero tariff. Um, bank to M-Pesa transfers were zero tariff. And uh, we also increased the limit from 150,000 to 300,000 on daily transactions. You could transfer on MBA in M-Pesa. And I guess the question is, what was the impact of that? In the first quarter, I mean, there was a literal standstill and stagnation in that period of time where it was driven by fear, insecurity. People didn't know what was happening. People could move. Economic activity slowed down significantly in that period of time. Um, from a customer behavior perspective, because people were looking at a more contactless life, you saw an up, uh, uh, people shifting into M-Pesa to enable contactless transfer of money. But also the economic impact meant that there was less activity to transact against. So in the first quarter of April, May, June, uh, from a transactions, the volume of transactions on M-Pesa remained pretty much similar as the, the quarter before. It was about 2.3 billion, pretty much similar because Transactions were fewer. People had less to interact with them. Um, we also saw, uh, so, that, so that was the first quarter. As we went into the second quarter, um, Kenyans began, yeah, there was a bit of easing in terms of the, the lockdown. Economic activity began to pick up. It will never go into the state of where we were before. But what began to happen is people began to try and identify a path to the new normal or to this next normal. And that we began to see in the, in the second quarter. Um, how did that show up? Um, use of M-Pesa continued. People now began to actually adopt more M-Pesa. We, I think, uh, brought in about 1.5 million customers came onto M-Pesa. Um, small, micro, medium-sized enterprises actually began to take on board even M-Pesa uh, tills. That went up by about 30% because customers were using contactless payments more than before. So they were also accepting contactless payments, so that also um, went up. Um, and also, quite importantly, because of the free transactions from M-Pesa into banks, what happened is merchants, for example, will go to the nearest M-Pesa agent, which was maximum, maximum two kilometers away at most. So they would actually take whatever cash they earned there and deposit it to the M-Pesa agent and actually get the, the deposit on M-Pesa and then transfer to their bank. We started noticing those kind of trends. So in the second quarter, as people began to slowly rebuild into the next normal or whatever version of the next normal it could be, we started seeing an upswing in terms of uh, the volume of transactions that went up from about 2.3 billion to about 2.8. Billion. The value of transactions also went up because the Pesa into banks, for example, um, um, increased. So that went from a trillion to about 5.2 trillion in that uh, quarter. And also the number of customers on Pesa did go up because more and more entities were beginning to use that. Um, but then it's the, the numbers may seem a bit inflated. It was important to recognize that by the time you're zero tariffing, what would happen is, if I was an individual who before I would send 3,000 shillings, I would now send 1,000 three times because of the zero tariff. So that the numbers feel a bit inflated because of that, but it's the, the number of times people began to, to, to shift money. So as uh, Dr. Mangi rightly calls out, we're beginning to make a path into the next normal. There's nowhere near where we were before pre-COVID. But I think what Kenyans are beginning to do here is beginning to try and get behind economic activity in order to enable lives and livelihoods to move forward. Thank you. And I think that's, that's something that we've certainly seen in our analysis, the different ways the different sectors of the economy have been affected. And so I just want to ask you, Isaac, um, this macroeconomic shock, which is COVID, how is it showing up in the, in the banking sector in terms of the portfolio management? Of course, 
um, Dr. Mangi mentioned some of them. But what are you seeing in terms of the assets that you manage? I think that from a broad uh, portfolio perspective, uh, Dr. Mwangi, I think, uh, nailed it in terms of uh, uh, the credit uh, the credit impact and what that uh, uh, shows in, uh, in uh, the longer term uh, uh, implications uh, to business. But I mean, principally, one of the things we are seeing is uh, we have in to, uh, uh, to restructure a lot of uh, facilities. And I think if we look at the total industry restructuring, uh, close to about 40% uh, of uh, all portfolios have actually had to be restructured, uh, especially uh, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, businesses were not generating enough cash uh, to be able uh, to pay the loss. So that, that I think, was the first immediate, uh, immediate cause, of, uh, cause of action. As things opened up, it is uh, eased up a bit, but I think the challenge is that uh, the impact on some, if I take the tourism sector, for example, which uh, uh, from a broader business perspective uh, is, is, uh, has a long lead to recovery. And so if people canceled their tourism activities this year, likelihood of them uh, booking again uh, will most likely be towards the end of 2021 which will then begin benefiting uh, 2022. So the recovery for those types of, uh, of industries is going to be much, much longer. And uh, uh, for us as banks, having given uh, some of those customers, uh, let's say uh, time or time off from paying, uh, uh, paying their loans, uh, they are not going to recover uh, very, very quickly. And so the expectation basically is that uh, we will have to look at further restructuring action uh, for some of those uh, for some of those businesses. So that that's really the biggest uh, impact uh, impact we see uh, from uh, from a business point of view. Uh, transaction volumes have also uh, gone down in uh, some cases uh, because uh, the recovery. If I take the restaurant business for example, uh, typically if you had a uh, hundred uh, uh, seat uh, restaurant and you turned it uh, three to four times uh, in a day. Uh, today, you are operating at about uh, 30 to 40% to be able to, uh, to recognize uh, the social distancing uh, requirements, which means that you need to turn it over close to 10, uh, to 10 times mm -hmm. to make the same amount of money you are making uh, in a day. But the reality is that you have to close by uh, 10 o'clock which means that by eight o'clock, a lot of the staff begin leaving, uh, uh, leaving the process of last orders at 10 o'clock. So the very, very fundamental changes in business, which has got to take place uh, to ensure that uh, uh, for the same amount of spent, and I think uh, Dr. Mwangi put it up, the costs are not disappearing, but the revenue is disappearing. Uh, when it disappeared, it is now coming back but not coming back to a level where it can surpass uh, the cost. So we all businesses are having to adjust uh, with, that kind of, uh, with that kind of challenge. And I think that uh, for us in the banking industry, we feel the biggest impact of that uh, much, much later. I believe that what we are seeing at the moment, if you look at third quarter results uh, for most banks, you will see that the level of impairment charges has probably gone up about uh, three or four times what it was uh, the previous uh, uh, three quarters. I expect that uh, that position is actually going to worsen into the future. It won't get better. It will only get better post 2022, in my view. Thank you. And, and I think that's a very sobering thought because I think, you know, particularly for the local households, um, which obviously we're all passionate about, I'm just wondering where they're going to go, you know, like how much further can they fall. And so I'm just asking, well, guys, you obviously you're, you're looking at health in a very serious way, um, and we're seeing the negative impact that COVID has had. Um, I'm just wondering what ideas do you have really around health financing? And I'm not talking just about COVID because I don't know how much mm -hmm. it's going to be there. But if you look at the systemic risk that, that health shops are having, what innovative ideas do you think are credibly, could be credibly applied in the Kenyan context? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, innovative. 
I'll, I'll choose a different word as opposed to innovative. Perhaps it's innovation uh, in itself uh, depends on how you define it. The role, as I had, uh, I had said in my earlier comment, it needs to be critic critically clear to all of us who is playing what role towards everybody's health. And I, and I like the quote um, that Julie gave at the end of her, her lecture from Amartya Sen saying individual freedom is a social commitment. The individual needs to take responsibility, and I think that's become quite clear. We have a slogan now given to us by the president, no hakuna baroko, hakuna huduma. No mask, no service. So you must take individual responsibility up to an extent. There's a critical role for private sector, and, and I must recognize uh, Dr. James Mwangi's effort with the COVID fund and, and all the work they've done into PPEs and, and such. And I also want to recognize the Firecom's partnership, uh, with, particularly with the call center, because that is something I was involved in, 719 call center, where people are calling in to get information about COVID work that we're hoping to expand. And in as much as, you know, COVID as a global pandemic has literally destroyed millions of people's lives now, people's livelihoods and people's futures, the world came to a standstill because health was not working. So health has to work. And how do we get health working? Health financing is one arm, and it is a very strong arm, knowing that you can pull levers. So what do we do different beyond thinking about how we finance? We critically have to think through the cost of care. And I think you've had our Cabinet Secretary for Health, Dr. Hikago, say over and over again, for the first time we had money and nothing to buy. The air spaces were locked. We used to import everything, everything, including cotton wool, everything. We had to figure it out. We had to get our industries to rejig. We've got petty industries now making PPE, who are previously making clothes for export. We've got other industries making viral transport media, things that we were unfathomable before. And now we are asking ourselves a critical question. How do I consistently drive those numbers down? It's not possible to allow the healthcare market to operate as any other market, assuming that the perfectness of any other market obtains in the, in the health space. There's so many asymmetries of information. And I want to just stay there before we talk about any other market failure. And I want to stay there because a critical lesson also we learned from this book that you find um, people in general, but even in more particularly for the poor, having to make decisions that they do not have the technical capacity to. How are you choosing between school fees and your health? How are you choosing between food and your health? How are you choosing between an NHF premium and your rent? Is that a choice? It's, it's undignified. It has to come um, become very clear to all of us that the world can stop, has stopped because of health. We have to get it right. It's not okay for it to be number four, number five on the list anymore. We have to get it right, and, we, and this is the golden chance to get it right. How do I consistently drive those numbers down? That doesn't mean just operate in the public space. That is an important space that you must operate, uh, knowing that majority of Kenyans access care there, but they access care there after having foregone care remember that, and having self-prescribed over and over-the-counter pharmacy, that has a cost. And so I, I cannot be oblivious to how much it costs to buy a painkiller in the pharmacy. I cannot be oblivious unto the quality of that painkiller in the pharmacy. That's one issue. Uh, I put it aside. The other issue I want to bring up um, that, that must be innovative not directly in the health financing, but critically affects the cost of healthcare are the health workers. And again, it, it cannot be an issue we discuss later on. It has to be front and stage, uh, front, front and center. Uh, it cannot also be an issue of this is a, a doctor who works in the private space, this is a doctor who works in the public space, or a nurse or a lab technician or any other health professional. Most of the time, they just crisscross between the two facilities because we don't have enough. This is a fundamental issue that we must address, must address now. Must address between the national governments, must address between the county governments. It cannot be that it's always a threat. And it's actually not that difficult to do it, we must just decide it's important enough. It is no longer number four on the list after the infrastructural projects. The world stopped because health was not working. I don't mean just Kenya, I mean even the biggest economies. And they are actually having a worse pandemic, if that is a thing that can be said. And so it has to come to ourselves and ask ourselves, we, we may have been aspiring to health systems that are ectopic. Uh, I don't know if that's too much of a medical word. 
exogenous. They do not belong to us. They are not working for them even now. And so we have to think about global health security. And I pray and I pray and I pray that uh, COVID ends soon, which is unlikely to be the last of a public health emergency. And so we must be ready uh, not to continue living in this fear, in this uh, uncertainty that we've described, where your world can stop because of one health event. So what systems are those that we are creating for ourselves that work for us, that can allow us to be self-reliant and that can constantly drive that cost of healthcare down for every single Kenyan? As I said, it is obviously worse for the poor, but you're just one ICU admission away from poverty. Just one. And I think, and I think that is so important, Dr. Wang. I just want to get your thoughts as I think we start to wrap up. Um, going forward um, from what we've learned in the next level, and obviously what you're seeing in terms of the impact of COVID on the how is that informing Equity's bank strategy and view on how they're going to continue meeting the needs of a lot of low income Kenyans, whether it's their firm activity needs or their household needs? Because this is unprecedented times. In, Obviously, your, your person has always um, shown the way. So I'd really like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, well, it just uh, allowed me uh, just to be able to what Wangari has uh, talked about. I think before equity, uh, uh, really evaluate its contribution. I think I want to build on Wangari a challenge to the government. I think uh, she brought it out to very well. Um, when uh, we travel on air, uh, you pay almost uh, uh, proportionately to your income. If you are in the past, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all the way to economy. When you use the road, if you have uh, a little bit more, you pay fuel directly. Mm. And, and that depreciation of a car. The rest of the other one states, if you are in the middle, you take a, a taxi and such, mm. such things. I think we must find a way of dealing with health such that we pay proportionally to our wealth or our earnings. At the moment, the low income, those who earn little or those who poor little, pay disproportionately to anybody else. Yeah. The government must also do the same for education. The government must also create policies that support SMEs, because that's where most of the people are making a living. And essentially, the government must also create a stable microeconomic environment where there is certainty about the economic prices of interest rate, inflation, and exchange rate and to create that stability. It's only on that basis that companies like Equity can come and say, yes, under the COVID environment, uh, as uh, just, just uh, said, will waive uh, transaction fee to make it possible for, and to incentivize people to comply with the COVID uh, uh, protocols without coming to the bank. So that is done. The banks can say that if you're in an uh, aviation industry, if you're in uh, the high level tourism industry, we'll give you a three year break. All those that can be done. We can also uh, look at uh, like uh, we have done for the banking industry maintaining uh, the interest uh, capping regimes just because the, the environment wouldn't allow it, even after the regulation had uh, been scrapped uh, to move out. But I think banks and equity will move very aggressively. And I'm glad, Julia, I want to thank you most sincerely for bringing out the mission and vision of equity. Uh, really uh, helping this book about uh, changing lives and livelihoods and giving dignity while expanding opportunities uh, to create wealth through SMEs. We have found ourselves in the right spot. Somehow it appears we were tailor made for a COVID environment. But as Wagare has said, this has just demonstrated the fragility mm -hmm. of the world. We need to be in the forefront as a corporate leader to really help by example, thinking about a more sustainable world, a more equitable world, and a more agile world. I think equity would be, and I'm glad I've signed up uh, uh, to purpose first, but be on the forefront uh, to not rebuild the world, 
but to build the world better. We must forget the world we, uh, that we found and build a new world that is better, that is equitable, that is inclusive, that leaves nobody behind, and that is agile. You can see how broken the world is. All the global value chains were broken in no time. Health was broken, mm. education was broken. That is how fragile and unsustainable the world has become. Equity will play its role and will not be shy uh, to put our best foot forward. And if you look at the moment, what we are really focusing on is uh, health. And I'm glad that during this COVID, we've increased and scaled our equity up here clinics from five to 30, because we have realized that there is no stable uh, banking with an healthy population. Health is basic. To create stability for business, mm -hmm. there must be stability to access in health. Mm -hmm. I think equity will do much more on education. I'm glad uh, that uh, we are headed now to 40,000 wings to fly kids. Again, we are speaking to uh, the weaknesses we were seeing uh, before, but now the weaknesses are completely exposed that education, health must be addressed. And so business like equity must all be purpose-driven, they must be mission-driven, and we must be in the forefront, and equity will be in the forefront, redefining capital, uh, capitalism. We must give capitalism a human face. Capitalism must have feelings, and capitalism must have a soul. The pursuit of profit is no longer sustainable. We all had all the profits, but we were equipped in a broken world without anybody being better than anybody else. That is what nature has taught us, that we all must follow a capitalism that creates equality in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mangan. And Deborah, I also want to get your thoughts on that. You know, sort of going forward, um, how are you, you know, from a survival perspective, uh, going to do things differently or do things the same um, to sort of meet the very dire situations a lot of kids are finding themselves in? So I really want to get your thoughts because obviously you're a leader in Kenya. The world has to look at Kenya in terms of all about money and the potential of digital technology and platforms. What are you going to do the same on one hand, but what are you going to do differently? Thanks a lot. I think if I pick up from the theme you raised about the, the businesses, the SMEs and the, the micro-businesses in the country, I think it's important to contextualize that and recognize that uh, the, the SMEs contribute 40% to the GDP of the country and they offer 80% of employment in the country. So supporting the SME environment is not a nice to do, but it is an imperative for corporate to get behind and really support the, the, the SMEs. When you look at uh, when COVID uh, uh, came, came, came through in, our, in, in effective from April, pretty much in this country, um, we did a study uh, of SMEs and the micro enterprises in the country. And at that time, 27% of SMEs, there's 7.4 million SMEs in the country, 27% shut down completely shut down. 44% did not know that they could survive into the next month. 44%. And only 8%, only 8% of SMEs had access to financial support in some form or manner. 92% did not know how they were going to operate. Only 8% said financial institutions were able to provide some form of support in that period of time. And that that was quite a dire situation. Um, so what we also did was try to understand what are the top issues impacting SMEs, and the top issues were access to credit, access to market, and then also really driving business efficiencies. How do they become more efficient in the running of the business? Those were the critical issues that were facing SMEs that we got into the into COVID food light. So as a business, we stepped back and said, for us, uh, the purpose of Safaricom is transforming lives. That remains the essence of what we are there for. That remains the essence of why we exist. And for us, we looked at it from a three, three phased approach. There was a respond, rebuild, and reemerge. In the response stage, it was the first thing we had to do at the point where the health was a crisis. 
and we had to respond to just hold the businesses and things like the zero tariff was an immediate response to enable to ease the financial pressure. Then we're looking at now as we begin to rebuild, the society begins to rebuild, as SMEs begin to rebuild, as businesses begin to rebuild, what are we looking to do? We're looking at actually creating or innovating around our portfolios to support the rebuild stage. And when you're looking at rebuild, businesses are beginning to think, small businesses, micros and small businesses are really beginning to think about how do they actually go about rebuilding. And we're creating tools, for example, an M-Pesa transaction tool, which enables, which enables the SMEs to actually directly order their supplies with their suppliers on, on or off their phone. So that really drives a sense of efficiency. Uh, we're also providing business tools that they can use off their phone. So instead of the exercise book, where you're actually looking at how much did I make today, you'll actually have an online tool that will enable you to look at your inflows, your outflows, enable you to look at your pricing, and that really begins to look at how they improve the efficiencies in the business. And that is the support we're bringing in to enable them to actually look at how they get into rebuild. And then the third stage is going to be the re-emerge, where that becomes our new normal. And in our new normal, how do we begin to redefine the ways in which we work? And our support in that particular bit in the re-emerge stage is how do you drive more access to market? Because access to market is one of the biggest problems. Um, um, SMEs face. For us, with 30 million customers on board on Safaricom, we're looking at creating things like a super app in which enterprise can actually onboard into there and have access to these 30 million customers on there. Customers can go onto the super app and look for whether it's a taxi, whether it's a border border, whether it's a bills you're paying. So create a super app that enables the SMEs to actually have access to our 30 million customers on we're also looking at online commerce. Online commerce, a lot of SMEs realized during lockdown that they couldn't physically access their customers. How do we enable them? How do we create the, the infrastructure for SMEs to actually get online and enable them to be online quite, quite in a very straightforward place? And those are some of the infrastructure bills we're looking at. And then, of course, there's access to credit, which will continue to be a key area that we're going to play. We've done a great job on access, providing access to credit to individuals. But now we're looking at how do we drive financial inclusion and financial help to SMEs. So the same way M-Pesa made breakthroughs with financial inclusion to individuals, we're looking at making breakthroughs with financial inclusion for SMEs. And those are the deliberate approaches that we're actually looking at. It's embedded in our strategy and in the heart of our purpose of transforming lives. It is an imperative of what we see as a corporate we have to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as, a, as you also, you know, as I ask you for your, your closing comments, um, I just want to hear from you what lessons have you in the banking sector also in the land from the COVID-19 uh, Dr. Wanky and Deborah who also uh, you know, interact there. But what lessons have you learned and how that changed or, or maintained how you interact, particularly with the, the low-income um, Kenyans who often don't interface very strongly particularly with retail banking? Thank you very much. I think we're reading from the same script. <laughs> but I think really, I think for me and uh, for us as, a, as an organization, <clears throat> we have recognized that uh, we need to simplify uh, a lot of things. Uh, we, do. Uh, we need to simplify uh, banking. Uh, we need to simplify the way our customers interact with uh, uh, with us, we need to offer much, much more in the universe of things uh, to our customers around uh, areas like uh, supply chain. So connecting markets has got to be a very, very critical role we've got to play as a bank. We've got to stop uh, thinking ourselves as uh, we take deposits and uh, and we lend and the world ends, uh, ends there. And even when we play that role, we must play it in a manner in which uh, there is a value-added process. Uh, which exists as a consequence of that. So, so we we are re, we are re, re, re looking at our, at our entire business uh, uh, business space in terms of uh, how can we then take uh, technology and uh, the digital opportunities which exist in this country, recognizing that uh, with all the successes we have, for example, in uh, the payment space, in uh, the lending space, and all that. If you take payment space, for example. 70% of all transactions, despite COVID, are still cash driven. So, so the reality is that uh, for me, the enemy is actually cash. 
And how do you make that cash work much, much better uh, in the economy? Uh, that is one. Uh, secondly, how do you connect markets much, much more? On the one side, you have consumers. On the other side, you have merchants. How do you bring them together? And what assets exist in the world, or rather in, in our world, in, uh, in Kenya and in the continent? And how do we then build partnership frameworks which allow us to create these connections, which allows consumers, merchants, merchants to merchants, consumers to consumers, to basically do a lot more with what they have in a much, much more uh, simple manner. I said I'm a retired banker at the moment, but I'm spending much more of my time uh, looking at how you use uh, technology and digital to create these uh, ecosystems and connections to make uh, banking hopefully much, much easier for Kenya and for the continent. Okay. And finally, uh, uh, sort of just finish with you around, you know, we, we've heard from everybody that health is foundation and that it's critical. In your view, um, what are the opportunities that you see for public sector and private sector to collaborate in very practical ways on this? I think obviously Dr. Mwangi, um, Deborah, and I have had you've seen the private sector rally. I think one of the concerns we have is that's just that's going to finish with COVID. Yeah. You know, so what I'm thinking is how do we make this sustain so that we deal with some of the structural issues that, that the panel is still thinking about? Yeah, thank you, Ntese. Um, I, I want to just start at the point you started first, that yes, truly, um, the pandemic has demonstrated that health is foundation. We found ourselves for the first time in a situation where we don't know what is coming and nobody knows. So there's nobody to come and build capacity and tell you this is how this one will evolve. And for the first time in a fairly bureaucratic organization, we had to be agile. Very strange word for an institution um, like the Ministry of Health, but more particularly because of the dogma of the practice of medicine. It is very bureaucratic, very hierarchical, top down. And so how are you agile in such a space? Um, point number one. Point number two, is that in as much as health is foundational, we also realized we can't do it alone. And here, when I say we can't do it alone, I mean government. You cannot be financier, you cannot be regulator, you cannot be provider all at once. It's not possible in a situation like this. And we, the whole of society approach, we talked about whole of government approach many years, but we, we were not as deliberate as on whole of society approaches, um, right from the community level, thinking about the individual in the community, in the community, in the organizations that they exist, in the Numba Kumis, in their religious um, organizations. And the, the religious institutions, uh, the Interfaith Council, played a, such a strong role in giving direction to their faithful on how to um, coordinate, how to carry themselves within this time. The private sector, and I give the two um examples of the of the COVID fund um, that's run with the assistance by the, of, the, of the equity bank in the Safaricom um, assistance is, is in multitudes. I only mentioned the call center, the thermal scans, uh, the, the physical assistance. Um, hearing uh, Dr. James Mangi say that equity AFIA clinics grew from five um, to 30. Uh, what I'd like to hear is uh, Safaricom is starting clinics soon uh, and, and maybe NCBA. And, and I'm not saying this because then government abandons, but you know, once we share out the duties, uh, that they, for you, the individual, this is how you take care of yourself. And this is what the community should do. And this is where the private sector investments can go. And this is the role that government plays in terms of covering um, those who can't cover themselves. Then we start moving forward because then you're not crippling the one organization to try and do any, everything. The last point I want to make actually goes beyond health. I think this COVID time has taught us about the indivisibility of social infrastructure. So you're not okay just because you don't have COVID. And I think this is what uh, my fellow panelists have been trying to demonstrate over and over. And what happens to all the gains we had made on education, on access to nutrition and access to safe water, what happens to all those gains? The indivisibility of investments in social infrastructure. We found people more worried about access to food, not nutritious food, just food within this COVID time. Right? And, and slowly you found that um, the self-adherence or the self-regulation in terms of adherence to curfews relaxed. 
And it's, it's not because they don't, they're not aware that the virus is there. But at the same time, you've seen Kenyans really take the responsibility of masking, uh, unlike um, other, other countries that we, that we know. And, and, you know. and yes, I know adherence is, um, is, to, is to varied levels, but there is the very fundamental Kenyanness. This, this needs to be made into an adjective. It, it really is just being Kenyan, uh, that you're taking individual responsibility to the extent that we can. So the challenge now really is on government, and I think these foundations that we've laid with COVID, they must go on uh, in, in really embracing every actor in society to partner with right be it the private sector be it the religious institutions be it the communities to move forward right and this this is not something we can let go it's, it's actually not possible to do it without them so it's it's not it's not going away take my word for it thank you so much and i just want to thank you all panelists sadly we do have to wrap up um, but thank you so much dr mangi for your time thank you so much deborah thank you isaac and thank you Mike. Ask you to just stay here um, so that we can launch the book and have your faces in the picture. Um, so I'd just like now to call. But I'd like to call um, the research fellow from the Institute of Development Studies, that's rather Australia, um, to come and uh, officially launch the book. I'd also also like the author. Oh, the, I'd like the author to come to the stage. Good afternoon. My name is Radha Upadhyay. I'm a research fellow here at the Institute for Development Studies, University of Nairobi. Um, and on behalf of my director, Professor Karuti Kaninga, it's been a great pleasure to host, to co-host this event with uh, FSD Kenya. Julie has always been very kind and come and spoken to our students through the last few years. And um, I know I've learned a lot from uh, this, the lecture and um, I'm sure everyone else has well. So it's my great pleasure to have this book officially launched and uh, I can ask people, uh, all the panelists to please hold it up. Um, so thank you very much, everyone who's been listening. Um, I'm sure you'll, uh, the book is available for free download, so I'm sure you will Google Living on Little and download it. For me, one of the most moving paragraphs was, Naomi was one of the many respondents whose lives were full, not just of struggle, but also of humor, community, ambition, and achievement. And yet, what I feel this book really shows is despite this uh, agency that um, people have, there are many systems that hold uh, them back from really, um, you know, enjoying the matunda yamaindeleo. Rightly, uh, Kenya is loaded as, as the cradle of financial inclusion because of equity, because of M-Pesa, because of M-Shwari. We are known world over as the cradle of financial inclusion. But I think um, the book highlights and our panelists have spoken about the big challenge that still remains for having a really equitable development going forward. So um, thank you very much and thank you all. And I hope you enjoyed the lecture as much as I did. Thank you.